With the series being over 4 years old now and having ended in 2018, hopefully, I've been thinking for a while now about someone giving the Five Nights at Freddy's series a more in-depth look after there being 6 games in the series now. And since no one has done it yet, I've decided to try and do it myself, even though I've never done a review before and I'm too poor to afford a camera. But screw it, let's do it anyways. Before we start though, I need to put some disclaimers up. Number 1. This review may be a bit biased since I am a fan of FNAF. I bought all the games when they came out. I always check the games website to see the latest teasers for the games. Hell, I even bought all the books because I'm that sad. Although, I don't own any of the figurines because I don't want to live that lifestyle. Oh shit, a Monopoly board? Well, I'm sold. Number 2. I won't be reviewing FNAF World or Ultimate Custom Night. Reason being that FNAF World can be a whole other topic to discuss and Ultimate Custom Night was originally intended to be DLC but was made as its own thing so it's technically not really a standalone FNAF game just an expansion or extra content. Number 3 No Law at All I'm not going to judge these games based on their story since that's the thing I don't want to get myself into. Number 4 The Jump Scares won't count at all as well. Now I know that this game is a horror game and its main scare is a jump scare but in my opinion the jump scares in FNAF are the most important things in it. It's the build up towards them that matters the most to me. So for this review, I'll be going over everything scary about the games except the jump scares. And number 5, the rating system. I'm going to be reviewing these games with my very own rating timeline because I'm that professional. Now with all that said and done, let's start the review with the start of course. Five Nights at Freddy's was released on Steam on August 8th, 2014, created by the Man-Man and All Genius himself, Scott Cawthon. The story starts with a guy named Mike Schmidt, who decides he wants to die a painful death one day, so he goes to work as the night guard in Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria for five nights from 12am to 6am while getting paid nothing. Danny realises that he has to work on the weekend as well, so on the seventh night, he says fuck it and tampers with the animatronics AI and eventually he gets fired. All while he's trying not to get violently raped by the four, maybe five animatronics that roam the place. Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy and I guess Golden Freddy but he's technically an easter egg so you can take that as you will. Now I have to say this right off the bat, the atmosphere in this game is phenomenal. From the eerie echoes and moans coming from the animatronics to the noisy clicks and stutters of the cameras. It makes you feel super uncomfortable and makes you more frightened of what these monstrosities called animatronics will do to you if they get to you. The mechanics are pretty simple. Bonnie and Chica are avoided by closing the door whenever they're right outside your office. Freddy also has the same mechanic too, but we'll get to him later on. And Foxy is stopped by closing the door as quickly as you can once you realise you're still alive after seeing him run on the cameras. Although you can make him not run to you sooner by staring into his eyes for long periods of time. All the actions you do in this game all affect your power meter, which gradually goes down every time you look at the cameras, close the doors, or turn the door lights on. That makes the feeling of you getting killed by God's mistakes even more terrifying, where you have to think wisely on what to do in order to have enough power to survive till 6am. Once you do run out of power however, Freddy decides to sing a little jingle and then he jump scares you. All of the mechanics are explained through pre-recorded messages from a guy named Phone Guy. Clever name, but you better put the biggest quotation marks on the word explain because he explains jack shit. Phone Guy's main purpose is for comedic relief, if you can call it that, and he serves not a whole lot of importance to this game, and in the later games he's just used as a lore device. Now him explaining barely any of the mechanics sounds bad, but with how easy the mechanics are to understand it's not that big of a deal. Now I may have 5 nights in the title, and you may have gotten a star for completing those nights, but the game actually has 2 more nights up its sleeve. The 6th night is what it is, a 6th night that gives you a second star, but the 7th night is where things get juicy. Here you can change the AI from pussy mode to sex machine mode. And what do you get when you set all the AI to 20? You get a third star on the menu screen, I failed my exams because of this. Now I won't give Scott flack for this because he himself thought that 420 mode was impossible. And him seeing other people beat him made him say, oh why not? And he just put in a quick little award for the completionists out there. Underwhelming, but there's an excuse for it I guess. But here's the biggest issue I have with this game. In general, it's way too simplistic for a horror game. Yeah, it wowed everyone on how such a simplistic game can be so scary, 
but it's kind of lost once you enter the fifth or fourth night. The mechanics are so easy to figure out that once you know what to do, the game becomes way too easy to beat. That is until Freddy Fuckboy here decides to come out of nowhere and he basically ruins the game. Not only do you have to control Foxy by staring at him, but you also have to stare at Freddy in order for him to not attack you. Now this wouldn't be so bad if you could at least see this guy, but all you can see of him is just two white dots. Plus, you have to make sure to hear him laugh so you know he's moved to another place. And this wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the other noises and sounds you have to hear around you. And worst of all, if he reaches the camera that's right outside your door, you have to stare at him at all times. Otherwise, he comes out of fucking nowhere and kills you. And this character is the reason why 420 mode is so fucking notorious for being a nightmare. Because this fuckface wants to rape you harder than any of the other characters. And then I need to manage Foxy, but no, I need to manage Freddy. And oh look, he's at my door, better close it. Oh no, my battery's going down, better open it. Oh no, what about Foxy? Oh shit, he's out, better close that door. Oh wait, now my battery's dead, and now I'm dead. Now to the rating. I'll put this game somewhere in between the middle and the top. While its difficulty is heavily on balance at points, its atmosphere and setting is super effective in giving the player a real chill down their spine. Let's hope that the next game can improve on the difficulty. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 was released on November 10th, 2014, just a little over 3 months from when FNAF 1 was launched. And Jesus Christ, this game is great. Before we get to why though, let's see what the story is about this time. It's just the same as FNAF 1's story, but instead Jeremy Fitzgerald wants to die now, and so does Fritz Smith on the seventh night. The premise as well is the same as the first game, where you have to survive five main nights, a sixth night, and a custom night. However, the custom night here is sent into categories, and if you beat one of them, you get a figurine placed on your desk. Neat. Now the three biggest changes this game has to the first one is number one, no doors, number two, a Freddy mask to defend yourself with, and number three, over 10 characters that want to rape you now. The characters present here are the original four cast, but more nightmarish, three animatronics that made Rule 34 say wow, Satan's son, this annoying prick, and abortion, and my nightmares. The mechanics to hold these guys off is far simpler, yet hard enough to make the knights a challenge to complete. All the toy animatronics, Balloon Boy, Mangle, Golden Freddy and three of the four rivet animatronics are all handled by putting on your Freddy mask and waiting for them to disappear. Rivet Foxy is stopped by constantly flashing your light at him just enough so he can run off and have a seizure afterwards. Too bad your flashlight has a limit which is way worse than a limit made in FNAF 1 with the doors and camera showing no percentage sign at all. Yet it feels more fair like this since the battery isn't affected by opening the cameras. And lastly the puppet is controlled by constantly bringing up the camera and winding up his music box. Even though the music box is the second most annoying thing in this game, first being this, it's completely understandable as to why it's in the game, so that there's a purpose in using the camera. Now I have to say, the atmosphere in FNAF 2 is just as good, if not better than FNAF 1's. If FNAF 1, while it did give you a chill down your spine, it can be quickly avoided by just closing both your doors. Here, there's no doors in sight, meaning that the animatronics could easily get to you in a matter of seconds making you feel more nervous in getting a jump skin. But the best thing about this game is the fact that the difficulty is so much better than FNAF 1's. This game can be challenging to grasp at the start and look challenging by having over 10 characters, but you can get an easy grasp on the mechanics in a matter of minutes. However, I do have some minor issues with the game, like how the mask is activated right next to where the camera is activated. So sometimes you might accidentally hit the camera whenever a character appears in your office. A way this issue could have been fixed would have been if the mask was activated through a keyboard action, like how the flashlight is activated through the control button for the hallway and the cameras. Also, why is there so many cameras? I get that each animatronic has its own route to your office, but it could have at least been reduced to 10 cameras rather than 12. Overall, I'll put this game at the top. This game does a lot better than its predecessor, even if I have some niche issues with it. But overall, it's the best FNAF game so far. Now on to the next game. Final Nights at Freddy's 3 released on March 2nd, 
2015 was released nearly 4 months after FNAF 2 and this game is kind of a mixed bag. The story here takes place 20 years after the events of the previous Freddy Fazbear Pizzeria, where a horror attraction named Fazbear's Fright is open, leading a guy with no name wanting to take up the role of the night guard to be killed slowly by one animatronic named Springtrap, which was set free by the guys who were searching the place. Yes, only one animatronic now. Plus, this guy also forgets to take his pills for a week, making him hallucinate six animatronics while doing his job to not die from this crazy lunatic of an animatronic. And after all your hard work, you don't even get paid. Instead, you come to the realization that there's two endings to this game, a good ending and a bad ending. And then the place burns down. Nice. To get the bad ending, you just have to play the game normally. Whereas to get the good ending, you have to play a couple of mini games throughout the whole five nights, hidden in the most niche places, and then you get a shiny star on the menu screen. A fun challenge to help cope with having to listen to Phone Dude. Uh, hello? 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 God damn it. The mechanics here are quite simple, yet complex at the same time. Springtrap follows a set path while also taking shortcuts through the vents. So in order to stop him, you have to cue Balloon Boy's laughs to send him back to his starting position. Man, Scott just loves torturing us, doesn't he? Anyways, if he gets into the vents, you switch your camera to the vent system, double click on one of the cameras, and he'll eventually get out of there. Sounds easy, right? Well, you have two roadblocks that make Springtrap get to your office quicker. The phantoms and this abomination of a mechanic. The mechanic in question is the maintenance panel, where you have to reboot your camera system, your audio devices that distract Springtrap, and the ventilation if it says error next to it. The cameras get an error if you use them for a long time, the audio gets an error if you use it too much, and the ventilation can get an error whenever it feels like, or if your hallucinations start to jump scare you. These hallucinations being Phantom Freddy, Chica, BB, Foxy, Mangle and Puppet. Phantom, Mangle and Puppet are just distractions, where Mangle can give you an error to your audio and the Puppet gives you a ventilation error while staring deep into your eyes in the process. The rest of the characters give you jump scares that instantly make your ventilation go off. The cues for them to jump scare you are fairly easy to avoid. Phantom Chica, Puppet and Mangle are activated if you see them on a specific camera whereas Phantom BB just appears on any of them, but you can just quickly exit the cameras to make him go away. Phantom Freddy attacks if you stare at him walking outside your office for long enough, and Phantom Foxy attacks if he wants to be a bitch and decides to appear in your office if you stare at his posture for a while. Now with all that out of the way, what's my opinion on the game? Eh, don't get me wrong, it's far from bad. Its mechanics are pretty clever, and the fact that this game can be challenging even if there's technically one character to avoid makes it more unique in the FNAF series. But honestly, this game has a lot more flaws than FNAF 1. With Springtrap being more shown in the dark in the cameras, once you see him in light, he looks kind of off, especially in the vents. Also, the atmosphere here compared to the other games kind of sucks. FNAF 1 nailed this because of the power limit, and FNAF 2 nailed this because of the openness of your office and the amount of characters coming to get you. FNAF 3 though, you feel more pissed off rather than worried. Sure, you get nervous if Springtrap is close to your office, but you can control him so easily at times. Plus, if he is getting closer to your office, you're most likely to be less worried and more annoyed with the phantoms and the amount of errors you get from the maintenance system completely ignore the sense of dread whenever Spoontrap is near. The worst thing about this game however is the difficulty. We went from somewhat unbalanced to stable to unbalanced again, but this time it's even worse. Some of the fandoms can be less of a distraction and more overpowered than anything, them being BB and especially Foxy. At least with BB you can avoid him quickly, but Foxy is just such a nuisance that it gets to a point where you can barely avoid him and he just jump scares you in an instant. Plus, Springtrap can be real quick and bullshit at times, making him much more of a challenge than he should have been. But the worst thing about this game? The Nightmare Night. Yeah, Scott decided to remove the 6th and 7th night, and instead called the 6th night Nightmare Night, and completely got rid of the 7th night, so he could add in a feature called Extras. Extras contains content that's actually pretty cool to navigate through, but kinda lame in hindsight, such as the animatronics, the jump scares, Mini games if you get the good ending, and the arguably best and worst feature, cheats. The cheats available are radar, which shows Springtrap on the cameras by a dot, 
no errors which is self-explanatory, fast night which is again self-explanatory, and aggressive which, you know what, we'll get to that one in a second. With extras out of the way, let's talk about the Nightmare Night. This night is the worst thing ever created the FNAF series, and holy shit, how is anyone meant to beat this fucking garbage? Keep in mind, this is just Night 6, and at least in the previous games, Night 6 can be tricky to do, but it's at least beatable. Here, it's insane. Combining unfairness of Springtrap with all the fandom's bullshit difficulties and Foxy, and you just got yourself a one-way trip to hell. And what do you get when you unlock this? A star, the jump scares, and a cheat mode section in extras. Kind of a dull reward for a bullshit night, eh? And guess what? You're not even done yet. To get the fourth and last star for Night 3, you have to not only play Nightmare Night again, but you have to activate aggressive mode while playing it. Aggressive mode is where if you enable it, you make the character's AI harder. So combine that with Nightmare Night, and you've got the worst possible thing to ever come from Scott's devilish mind. Now I completely understand that these stars and nights are optional, but in my opinion, Nightmare Night should have been Night 7 instead of being a replacement for Night 6, which would have been more fair for players who'd want to get all the stars in the game. Also, whilst editing the video, it turns out that Scott didn't even know that it was possible to beat Nightmare Night with aggressive mode on. But in my eyes, that's kind of a lame excuse because, well, he already thought that 420 mode for FNAF 1 was impossible, and that was beaten instantly, to an extent. So, still my point kind of is valid, but I can understand why people would disagree. FNAF 3 gets placed smack bam in the middle. While creative in many aspects, such as in the mechanics, it can be a honking load of crap with its difficulty, and can throw players off a lot of times. With all that said, let's move on to the next game in the series. Final Fantasy Freddy's 4 was released on July 23rd, 2015, over 4 months after FNAF 3, and I'm gonna be honest here, I don't like this game. Now let's first go through the basics of the game before I head straight towards my opinion. The story now is that you're playing as a small child who is always tormented by his dick of a brother with the masks of the animatronics of Freddy Fazbear's or Fredbear's or Junior's, I don't even know at this point. All of his brother's acts lead him to have nightmares of the animatronics for at least a week before his brother gives him a big surprise on his birthday by stuffing his head in an animatronic's mouth and killing him in the process. Now the biggest note to take from this story is the fact that you're not playing as a suicidal night guard anymore, but instead a traumatized child trying to get rid of the creatures coming for him in his own home. This was a great breath of fresh air for the series, since the fans were starting to get kind of tired of playing as another night guard hoping to get his crappy paycheck by the end of the week. The atmosphere in the game also felt much scarier than the other games, where instead of being in an office, you're now in a child's bedroom, making you feel more connected to the setting around you, and the sounds of cars honking and distant dogs barking in the background really helped to make you feel more terrified about the location you're in. The characters in the game now are called Nightmare Animatronics. Huh, I wonder how they got that name. There's Nightmare Bonnie, Chica, Freddy, Foxy, Plush Trap, and a new addition to the cast, Nightmare Fredbear, and the most original name for a character ever in FNAF, Nightmare. There was, however, a Halloween update for the game, adding three new characters to the game, them being Nightmare BB, Nightmare Marion, and Nightmare Mangle. But they are just replacements for some of the characters in the game, so we won't count them in. Now not only was this setting new for FNAF, but so were the mechanics. The biggest change with the mechanics are there being no cameras at all. Instead you have to run towards the two doors around you, move towards the closet, and always check behind you. To this day, I still don't understand why a child needs two doors for their bedroom. Bonnie and Chica come for both doors, and to stop them, you have to listen if there's any breathing outside, and if there is, you just shut the door in their face. Foxy runs towards your closet whenever you're not looking, and once he's in there, he decides to hide there for the rest of the night. The way to stop him from killing you is to shut your closet door enough times to somehow turn him into a plushie. Don't ask. Freddy is stopped by flashing your light at his little companions known as Freddles, that for some reason love to have seizures on top of your bed behind you. The max amount of Freddles that need to appear for Nightmare Freddy to jump scare you is free. But luckily, you know whether or not most or all of the Freddles are on your bed if Freddy decides to go and stay with the light switch in your room. Plus Trap isn't a character that appears during the night, 
but instead is present once you've been in a night. All it really is is just a mini game. And I have to say, it's pretty unique what Scott did with Plus Trap in the game. What you have to do is you have to make sure that you stop Plus Trap on the X in front of you. The way to do this is by flashing a light at him, which stops him dead in his tracks. Problem is, is that you only have a small amount of seconds to do this. Plus, Plus Trap runs real quick, so you better make sure he doesn't jump scare you or stay in the same position for a long time. Getting him on the cross makes you start the next night two hours early, and that could either be a blessing or a problem depending on how you interpret it. Nightmare Fredbear only appears after 4am on night 4 and for the whole of night 5. The hard thing about him is that not only does he appear at your doors, but he can also appear in a closet and on the bed. If he's outside in the hallways, you need to quickly flash a light on him and shut your door. If you hear a loud and deep laugh, he's either in your closet or on your bed. But you have to be quick to figure out where he is because he can be really quick to jump scare you. Nightmare operates the exact same as Nightmare Fredbear, but is much more aggressive and only appears on night 7 aka Nightmare Night and 4am onwards in 420 mode aka Night 8 all you have to do is type 2020 2020 in the extras menu and you've got Night 8 a bit of an obscure way to get it but it makes sense nonetheless speaking of the extras menu it's back in FNAF 4 and it's much better than FNAF 3's extras not only do you have the jump scares and animatronics but you also have the process of making Nightmare Foxy and Nightmare Fredbear which is so cool to check out. It also has the Nightmare with Plus Trap minigame and of course Nightmare Night. In the Halloween update, Scott decided to add even more stuff to the extras, such as cheats that are pretty self-explanatory, fun time with BB, which is just fun time with Plus Trap but replaced with something that came out of saying its penis, and the newly introduced challenges, which are modes that make the nights harder. Scott also decided to add 6 new stars to the mix with these challenges. 4 of them are unlocked if you enable one of the cheats for Nightmare Night, the fifth star is obtained if every challenge but all Nightmare is ticked. And the sixth star is unlocked if you beat Nightmare Night with all Nightmare and Blind Mode on. Thankfully, these are nothing but fun challenges for completionists out there. So I have nothing to complain about here. Now, you remember how I said before that I don't like this game? Well, get ready because there's a lot of things I don't like about this game. Starting with... Why the fuck is the main mechanic in this game your ears? For a game that mainly revolves around jump scares, using audio as the main mechanic to even survive a night is the absolute worst technique to scare the player shitless. It's just such a cheap tactic that it makes it look like Scott just got lazy and decided to put this in the game to make it scarier. But the worst thing about it is that you can't even play the game with speakers. You have to play with headphones on in order to hear Bonnie and Chica's breathing. And not only that, but you need to at least have your volume close to fucking 100 to even hear them breathing. Well, for me at least. The breathing was so hard to hear that Scott had to update the game to make the breathing louder. Now before you say in the comments, yes audio has been used as a mechanic in the previous games as well. But they only there's additional help. FNAF 1 did make you have to use audio for Freddy, but you could use some tactics to beat the game without listening for his laugh. FNAF 2 barely used audio as a mechanic, where it was only ever used to know when someone was in events. And FNAF 3 used audio to help players know if Springtrap was in events or not. FNAF 4 just full out embraces audio as a main mechanic, and while it was used in creative ways throughout the game, it just comes off as a cheap tactic to make you jump even higher out of your chair once a jump scare occurs. So the main marketing campaign, if you could call it that, for FNAF 4 was that it was going to be the final chapter in the series. So you would think the ending of the game will actually be the best ending out of all the FNAF games. FNAF 1 and 2 didn't really have any mind blowing endings, but they can be an excuse since FNAF was still in its early days and Scott was still thinking of how to flesh out the series. FNAF 3 had the most perfect ending to it having a bad ending and a good ending if you do all the hidden mini games throughout the five nights. It was so good in fact that everyone thought it was the last game in the series. So how could a FNAF 4 top the somewhat sad ending of FNAF 3 and you end the series off with a very, very high note by saying fuck it, deciding to take lacadives and shit out the worst possible ending for a series. That being a locked box with the text, some things are best left forgotten for now. Only for Scott to later say that the box will never be opened. Nice. To be fair, Scott did say why he would never open the box, saying now he thought the fan base wouldn't be ready to face what was inside of it due to no one understanding the story. And speaking of the story, 
Now I know I did specifically state that there will be no mention of lore in this review at all, but the lore was a factor in ruining the game in my honest opinion. You see, since this game was supposed to be the last game in the series, you would think that the story would end in a nice little bow, but instead it went the complete opposite way. People were so confused as to what anything in this game meant, from where this was set, to who this kid was, to even if this incident took place in 1983, or 1987. Argument after argument after argument about whether this was true, or this was true, or this was false, and the thousands of theories about what was in that goddamn fucking box made the story so convoluted that Scott decided to scrap the idea of FNAF 4 being the last game in the series and instead made FNAF 6 location. That's when you know you fucked up. For me, FNAF 4 has to be placed in between the middle and the bottom. While having the most unique concepts and ideas the FNAF series has ever had, it falls flat on its face by having cheap mechanics, a bad ending, and the worst cliffhanger, if you could call it that, for a series finale. With all that said and done, let's get right into the next game of the series. Final Fantasy Free Assist Location or simply FNAF 5 was let loose on October 7th 2016, over a year after FNAF 4 was released. And my god was that break worth it, because this game is a masterpiece. The story now is that you play as the purple guy's son, Michael Afton, sorry, I meant X Benedict, who decides he wants to explore his dad's basement one day, which turns out to be a fully fledged animatronic funhouse, and after four nights of doing whatever, and watching a cheesy romantic drama about Dracula's love life, please don't ask. You eventually get all your organs and bones scooped out of you and turn into that. This game has to be the most refreshing breath of fresh air this series has ever had since FNAF 4, because for the first time ever, you aren't set in one place, you're instead in different areas and different rooms every night, and this way of playing the game has to be the best part about it. I think the reason Scott went with this new approach to the FNAF series is because he wanted this game to be a better ending for the series than its predecessor, meaning the game had to be heavily story based in order to please the lore based fans. Now that does sound bad for newcomers to enjoy the game, but somehow Scott made the story of the game look simplistic on the outside, but once you delve deeper into it, a whole new story starts to unravel, making the story balance between a new player and a long time fan of the series. Now let's talk about the animatronics. The newest characters here are Baby, who's the leader of the pack, her minions the Biddy Babs, Ballora, her minions the Mini Reeners, Ennard, who appears later in the game, Funtime Foxy, Funtime Freddy, and I guess Bon Bon Biddy's part of Funtime Freddy, yet he can move around by himself, so you can go either way with that. The weird thing about this lineup is that Chica isn't present anywhere in the game. Although I think one potential porn character is more than enough. Now explaining the mechanics for the animatronics is kind of tricky because the characters don't have a strict mechanic. They all have different attributes in each night. So with this review, I'll be talking about what happens on each night to show what roles and actions each character has in trying to rape you. Night 1 starts you off with having to listen to a much more bearable phone guy named Hand Unit. You go through a vent and enter this office, where you have to check if Ballora and Funtime Foxy are on stage. You do this by activating the lights with this panel, and if they're not there, you give them a controlled shock. After that, you go to where Baby stage is and electrocute her until she's on stage. Then you leave. Now if night one was just a walk in the park, next night is far from that. Night 2 you do the usual shtick where Hand Unit decides to go into angsty teen mode and casually tells you that the vents you're crawling in had a dead body in there. Once you check Foxy and Ballora, you then check on Baby and when she doesn't come on stage the power goes off. So whilst Hand Unit fixes it, he has to turn everything off causing the vents to open and make Baby have the Biddy Babs attack you. Luckily she gives you a little pep talk to help you with avoiding him. So what you do is hide in a compartment someone already made and make sure Biddy Bab doesn't open it up and kill you. Once that's done, you go back to the office and you get told to move through Ballora's area to get to parts and services and reset the power. Baby tells you to go slow to not get killed by Ballora, so after you nearly shit your pants after this bit, you have to get all the power to 100%, but 
but that ain't stopping Funtime Freddy from ruining the fun. So in order to stop him, you gotta keep Bon Bon saying that that fresh meat over there isn't worth it. Once you get the power back on, you race back to your office and leave. Next up. Night 3 starts you off with some kick-ass casual bongos, and after that you get given the task of having to repair Funtime Freddy. But the only way to do that is by going through Funtime Foxy's area. Now the way you have to avoid her is by flashing your light to see if she's close to you or approaching you. If she is close to you then you must stay still and wait for her to go away. After that you get the joy of clicking on Funtime Freddy to repair him and then... Well played Scott. Well played. Once you think you're done you realise that Bonbon bon has escaped from Freddy's hand. So in order to stop him from jump scaring you, you must click on his nose. Too bad he really hates your light, so you have to be extra cautious with your flashlight for this part. Once that's done, you walk back to your office, but not before Funtime Foxy jump scares you, leading to... Now, night four. You know what, let's talk about this night later. Night five starts with you being told that your reward for being the night guard for the facility is exotic butters. After you laugh for about 2 minutes, you get told that there's also technicians on site, so you won't feel too alone. I wonder where those guys could be. Huh. Anyways, you get told that your job now is to fix baby, so once you get to her, she tells you that she's broken and they want to scoop her. But apparently they won't fix her, so you have to save the good parts of her, so the bad parts are destroyed. Once you enter a random code and grab a green key card, baby tells you the directions to the scooper room to save her. Uh oh, it turns out it was all a trick by Annett to escape from the hellhole around him. So he scoops you and takes over your body. The end. Or is it? Turns out that ending you got was the real ending, aka the bad ending. So in order to get the good ending you have to complete one minigame, which shouldn't be too hard, right? Right? Once you finish the minigame you play Night 5 again, but instead you do the opposite of what Baby says when she tells you the directions for the scooping room. Doing this gives you access to what I'm going to call Night 6, in which you have to stay in a FNAF 1 looking office until 6am while trying to avoid Ennard who gets more aggressive as time passes on. This has to be a pretty fun challenge, not hard yet not easy as well, and I'm pretty glad that Scott didn't just make a whole new set of mechanics for this night and just stuck with FNAF 1's mechanics, so the player wouldn't be confused and would feel more comfortable in completing the night. Once you finish it, you go home and enjoy your exotic butter. The end. Until you see a custom night exist. Now I'm not going to go too in depth with this night since it is DLC for sister location. But all that happens is that you get a cutscene every time you beat a set mode. And once you beat the hardest one, you get the last cutscene of the game and you're done. Now that we've discussed the good stuff and the nights, let's start to talk about the issues of the game. Night 4 is fucking ridiculous. You wake up in an animatronic suit after Funtime Foxy raped you, and you witness Belora getting scooped right in front of you. Once she's dead, Baby tells you that in order to escape from the suit, you'll have to wait for the technicians to see you in the suit via the cameras. Too bad the spring locks are rusty as hell, so once the suit's open, you gotta wind up the spring locks and not get crushed by them. Seems easy, right? Well, it turns out Belora's babies, the mini Renas, want to fuck you over, so they'll not only climb along your suit, but they'll also climb inside your suit. The way to get rid of the ones climbing on the side is to shake your suit, but turns out the ones climbing inside of you don't like that, so you gotta make sure they're not climbing in your suit so you can shake. All while you have to wind up 10 spring locks, and all this needs to be done in 3 minutes. Now that sounds easy, but trust me, those 3 minutes will feel like 3 hours since you keep dying and dying and dying all the fucking time. This night was so hard that Scott had to update the game to make the night easier, but it's still a piece of shit to complete. Unfortunately, night 5 is only beatable by having your headphones on and listening to what baby says, leading you to get scared more if you get jump scared, and we all know how much I love that mechanic in the previous game. Luckily it isn't too much of an issue since you can hear baby well through your speakers, plus this is only used fully once. Yeah you need audio for Ballora and Funtime Foxy, but it is possible to get past them without hearing their footsteps. Oh yeah, Funtime Freddy uses it, but there's no real jump scare other than that cop out one. Holy crap this minigame is way too hard, and I mean way too hard for a normal person to complete. 
fucking night 4 is easier than this shit. The amount of precise jumps you have to make to not only pass holes but to also feed the children can go and fuck right off. The fact that each kid is assigned to a specific cupcake makes it where if you make one single mistake you fail instantly. This wouldn't even be so bad if there wasn't a one minute time limit. What the hell Scott? And you need to do this minigame in order to access night 6. But thank god you can get this minigame through two ways instead of one. The first way is by dying five times and the second way is by hovering your mouse over the bottom left hand corner of the extras menu. Thank the lord that it's available in the extras menu, otherwise this game would have been lower on my list. Oh yeah, I forgot about the extras menu. All there is is just pictures of the animatronics in the game, the making of Foxy, Baby and Freddy, some blueprints and EXOTIC BUTTERS. This game gets placed below FNAF 2 but above FNAF 1. Despite Night 4, the mini game, and having to use audio as a main thing again, this game has to be one of the most innovative FNAF games of all time, and it definitely was worth the wait for it. Plus its ending and story was pretty stellar, and was a great game to finish the FNAF series off on. Psych. Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, or as I'm calling it, FNAF 6, was released a little over a year after Sister Location on December 7th, 2017. And like FNAF 3, this game is another mixed bag for me. So the story now is that you decide to run a Freddy Fazbear Enterprise where you buy decorations, animatronics and arcade games to help not only make your place look nicer and bring more customers, but also get that sweet sweet dough. Of course, the main ways you can get money in the game is by accepting sponsors, playing your arcade machines and salvaging animatronics for your pizzeria. Just make sure they don't kill you in the process. While you're doing that, you also have to do all the daily tasks in a pretty small and somewhat creepy office. Simple right? Well you're dead wrong because those salvage animatronics will try and rape you while you're doing your tasks. So have fun. Also after about a week the facility burns down for law purposes and all the animatronics burn including you Michael Afton from the previous game because you somehow survived that. There's not too much animatronics in this game now. The animatronics here are pretty simple. We've got Scrap Baby, Molten Freddy, Lefty, who is the puppet in disguise, William Afton aka Spoontrap, and I guess Helpy, but if we're considering characters that attack you, then he's out. Now with this game, the animatronics don't actually have unique mechanics. Instead, Scott made the decision to make all of them act the same way through the nights, increasing the AI so the game doesn't become too easy. Before we talk about what you're even meant to do when you're in the office, let's first talk about the pizzeria simulator side of FNAF 6. So throughout the week, you have to maintain your pizzeria without running low on cash. So to gain money, you need to buy, add, and even play a whole bunch of stuff so your faz rating can increase. Salvaging animatronics helps a ton, giving you more money than you'll ever get in real life. To salvage an animatronic, you have to play some disturbing noises and make sure that the animatronics don't attack you. In order for them to not do that, you have to taser them, making them stabilize. But be careful, because after 3 zaps, your profit for salvaging the animatronics decreases, so you better use that taser wisely. Another way to get that dough is by playing the mini games in your facility with your FAS tokens. Some of them can go from fun, to raw based, to downright gruesome. The best way to get quick cash however is by purchasing sponsors for the pizzeria. The only problem with that is that they can affect you during the night, which I'll explain better later on. Now the way you purchase things for your pizzeria is through catalogs. The things you can buy in the catalogs are pretty damn magical. You can buy decorations and minigames as previously stated, but you can also buy animatronics like Funtime Chica, El Chip, Music Man, and my personal favourite, Trash in the Game. I'm sure everyone wants to come to my pizzeria now with these guys here. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows because you can actually get lawsuits in this game. And they're just downright ridiculous. Like look at this, you got help you with his glasses on going through your legal fees and settles. I'm like what's going on? So the parents union of unsafe atrocities and mechanical abominations aka no are suing me because a young boy fell down a slide, got up and fell down again. Okay, this is the best game ever made. 
Honestly, the Pizzeria Simulator side of the game is pretty much the best part of the whole game. With its quirkiness, its jokes, and its entertainment value, showing how much Scott did to make this part of the game fun for anyone, whether you're a FNAF fan or not. Oh, and before I forget, let's talk about the unlockables for the menu. Not only can you get certificates for unlocking the multiple endings, which I'll go over in a sec, but you can also get badges for buying a whole set of animatronics and putting them up on stage. I'm very proud of this one in particular. Now let's get into the endings. The completion ending is unlocked once you've completed the game normally. The mediocrity ending is unlocked if you throw away all the animatronics instead of salvaging them. Plus you don't buy anything for your pizza here. The insanity ending appears if you buy this thing. Do a bit of this and a bit of that and you get this on your screen. The blacklisted ending happens if you get lawsuits but are able to go through the whole week without losing to them. The bankruptcy ending happens when you lose a lawsuit, and a law keeper ending is unlocked by completing all the law based minigames whilst completing the game normally. You can also get a bad ending if you don't salvage any of the animatronics when playing the game normally, though you don't get a reward for doing it like that, so there's really no point in doing it. All these endings and badges help to give this somewhat simple game a great replay value, possibly the best replay value this game has ever had. But that all ends once you get into the main part of the game, that being the night parts. So let's explain the mechanics. Your office contains two vents that both next to you and in front of you is a monitor. On this monitor you have four tabs. The first tab is the tasks, where you have to complete all of them in order to pass the night, meaning there's no finish till 6am gimmick present here. You can also make your tasks produce less noise by paying in the equipment section to make things quieter. The second tab is the motion detection tab, where you can enable it to track where the salvage animatronics are in the building. The third tab is the audio tab, where you can enable audio around the facility to make the animatronics move towards the sound. Kinda like the audio devices in FNAF 3. This also shows where the animatronics are, making the motion detection tab kinda pointless, but not as pointless as the fourth tab, the vent. This basically makes the ventilation system quieter, but it still produces noise. Plus turning off the vent is much more efficient than making the vent quieter, so don't bother with it. Speaking of ventilation, let's talk about these things next. So in order to make sure that the animatronics don't come and rape you while you're doing your task, you'll need to either turn your ventilation off or turn the power off, or both. Turning them off however has its drawbacks. Turning off the power turns off the progress of one of your tasks if you weren't in the middle of one, and turning off the ventilation makes your temperature go higher, eventually making you pass out if you have it off for too long. Now the reasons as to why the animatronics come to get you are fairly simple. If there's too much noise from the ventilation, the tasks, or the advertisements from your sponsors See why they're bad now? The animatronics will start crawling into your vents to get you. Luckily, if they do enter the vents, all you have to do is face them from whichever vent they're in. And guess how you figure that out? By hearing their thumps in the vents. Yes, we're back to audio being the main mechanic in a FNAF game now. For God's sakes, really? Okay, okay. I get it, you can be the game without the audio, and you can track them in the vents with the motion detection, but my god is it hard to try and do that. Using your headphones is pretty much the best way to know if they're in the vents or not, and is the easiest way to beat the game. But why Scott, why? Also I feel like this game is way too complex for a newcomer or even a FNAF fan to get a hold of. There's no real way of figuring out how any of this works in the easiest way possible. Yes, 9-1 helps with letting you get used to the environment, plus baby roams the place, but I reckon it could be better if baby was more active instead of appearing either once or not at all. Hell, the mechanics were so confusing that Scott had to explain them in a Steam post later on. Also, the difficulty can get pretty out of control, especially on Thursday night and onwards. Oh yeah, and the atmosphere sucks. Where's all the creepy and unsettling ambience? Instead, all I hear is this moaning vent, and the animatronics whispering in my ear like it's a porno. I get it, you want there to be less ambience so the player can hear the whispers, but FNAF 4 had grey ambience, and I use audio as a mechanic way too much. Like, maybe you could have them animatronics that you bought for the facility play their music out of nowhere. That would be kinda creepy and cool. Plus, there's also some other grabs I have with the game. 
For one, I kind of wish that the pizzeria simulator acted on the night duty part more. Like you have the sponsors with the ads, but what about something like the more decorations you buy for the pizzeria, the more colour your desk could be to the point where it covers the screen? Dumb idea I know, but it would have been cool to have more implications like that in the game. Another thing I think would have worked would be maybe one more scrap animatronic to come and attack you. I feel like that would have made it better, cause it would have made the game more easier, yet more challenging, since Scott would have had to reduce the AI to make the player actually beat the game. And the biggest issue of all, why the fuck can't you buy the pickles? Why are they unavailable for fu- oh. This game's better than FNAF 1, yet a little worse than FNAF's sister location. While being way more innovative than sister location, I reckon the mechanics being hard to get the hang of, the AI being pretty difficult to manage, and the use of our ears as a mechanic again, just made the game suffer in the long run. However, I won't lie, this game had a better lore ending for the series than Sister Location did. So good job, Scott. So it's done. The whole FNAF mainline series is finished. While it did have many ups and many lows, the FNAF series will have to go down as one of the most innovative game series out there. And I reckon nothing could beat the unique ways that Scott used to make FNAF more fresh and innovative than ever. Hell, he made three completely new and distinctive FNAF games before the first game turned a year old. From the lore to the mechanics to even the characters, we all have to give Scott credit for what he's done for not only the horror genre, but indie games as a whole. And that's probably the best thing about the whole FNAF series. Are you fucking serious?